Joining us now on the debate for the full hour tonight, in New York, New York, Andrew Revkin, author of the Dot Earth blog at the New York Times. And here in studio, Jack McConnell, professor of atmospheric science at York University. That's not him, that's Richard. <laughs> Richard Peltier, atmospheric geophysicist at the University of Toronto. And now the aforementioned Jack McConnell, professor of atmospheric science at York University. As I welcome you all to the program tonight, I want to just sort of set up why we're doing what we're doing this evening. A couple weeks ago, we aired four programs on climate change. Uh, we talked about whether the science was settled. We talked about how the media covered the climate change issue. We talked about how scientists either like or mostly don't like getting involved in all of the politics around this. And we talked about geoengineering. And we got a lot of reaction to those four programs. Andrew, I think you actually sent us a note about it as well. And we wanted to follow up on an issue that came up numerous times during the course of those four programs, but we actually didn't do a full program on it. So we're going to do that tonight. And that was this issue of climate modeling, which is at the basis of so much of the debate. What it is, how it works, why is it so central to the climate change debate? So without further ado, Andrew, get us started on this. Let us start with, in fact, an overview of what we're talking about. When you talk about global climate modeling, what do you mean? Well, for decades, for four or five decades, really, scientists have been trying to figure out a way to, to build a stunt planet. We only have one Earth, so we're uh, in the 50s. Um, Roger Revelle and, and a colleague uh, said we're essentially conducting a, a glo global geophysical experiment. The problem is we're in the test tube and there isn't another one to do the, the case control study on. So what do you do in a situation like that when you're, you're, you're trying to understand processes afoot in a complicated planet? And, yeah. You don't have a, a, a stunt planet, as I put it sometimes. So you don't have a stunt and planet, so what do you do? Well, you start building, uh, you start building one ma mathematically. You create a, a set of formulas that essentially replicate a, a, a grid, hundreds of them, uh, thousands in many cases, that sort of each one is a little set of equations that tell you how one little block of the atmosphere relates to the next one, and the next one, and the one above it, and the one below it. And uh, it's basic thermodynamics, uh, heat, and uh, other and visible light are flowing through this thing, and you can kind of model that. And uh, initially, in a very crude way, and now recently, we scientists have been able to add the oceans in, and they they try to estimate and replicate what sea ice does. And and now they're trying to do other kinds of modeling related to uh, things as as complicated as how big ice sheets move. And and all of that's an attempt to get a little bit of a head start on understanding how the planet's going to react to um, some of the things we're doing to it. Okay, to that end, we've got some video here that may help explain what you just, I think, very uh, ably explained. This is tape from the Geophysical Fluid Dynamic Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey, describing climate models. And here we go. It's known about the way the climate system works. Express it mathematically and then translate it into computer code. All the computations done in a climate model are performed on grids that divide the planet's atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, and land into many, many boxes or grid cells. And that the model simulates how energy, air, water, and other <coughs> things that affect our climate travel through all those grid boxes. For example, in 2008, GFDL researchers created a global climate with a total of about 55 million grid boxes. Okay, that's a little chunk from that video. Jack, let me follow up with you. These grid boxes, what is the purpose of dividing up the planet into all of these grid boxes? <coughs> well, we need to, the, the very lot of complex processes going on, and the, uh, the smaller we make gr the grid boxes, the, the uh, more accurately you can represent the physical processes that are occurring. Uh, and, uh, but this also points out to one of the limitations of, the, uh, of having the grid boxes because no matter, how you make it, no matter how small you make the grid boxes, there's always something going on inside the grid box that you have to parameterize. It. That's a fancy word for saying approximate. And I think that's a lot of the, a lot of the finger pointing is going on with the models is that these approximations that are made uh, that uh, can cause problems, cause uncertainties to arise in the, in the modeling process. So even when you take this vast planet and you break it down into these tiny grid boxes or tiny chunks, tiny by the standards of a map, they're still fairly big and there's still lots of stuff going on within those grid boxes that makes perfection difficult to achieve. Exactly, yeah. That's and it. I mean, you can think of I mean, at the, uh, the extreme case, you can think of one photon interacting with one molecule of light. And that's the microscopic, the sub-microscopic scale. 
And, uh, and yet that is, that is affected in effect represented by these models. And in actual fact, that actually does, we actually do quite a good job there. Not perfect, but, uh, but actually we actually managed to do quite a good job, even having this sort of sub-microscopic uh, scale within these boxes, which might be in a climate model. Uh, we're not talking about weather forecast model, but a climate model, maybe 150 kilometers in each grid box, or mm -hmm. somewhere between Toronto and, and Kingston in the global climate models as opposed to the regional climate models, which you might talk about later. Gotcha. In fact, well, we've got some video here we want to show, and uh, Dick Peltier, I'll get you to react to this. This next thing that we're going to show is a representation, again, from the same lab, showing the grid boxes. They used to represent the Gulf of Mexico from the 1980s mm -hmm. to the 1990s. To here it comes. There's the 80s. There, now we flip it over to the 1990s. We can see it's getting a little more technical, uh, smaller grid boxes. There's 2004, so even better yet. And then last year, wow, really, really quite specific, uh, quite s smaller. More grid boxes presumably means, help us through this, more data, hopefully more accurate results. But how has the growth of the grid boxes added to the time and effort that it takes to design and build one of these global models? And therefore, maybe it doesn't get us further ahead? I don't know. You tell me. Well, I mean, first you have to understand that this process of model building is one that has been really incremental. I mean, Andrew has talked about co sort of startup of the I IPCC process in the mid-80s. This is the Intergovernmental, the panel, intergovernmental, on climate intergovernmental, climate intergovernmental panel on Climate Change. And, you know, in the, at that time, we were working on grid boxes which were about 5 by 5 degrees or even 7 by 7 degrees, very low resolution, very r low resolution models. And um, today, the resolution is, as you've shown on this, film, on this film clip, very, very much higher than we certainly had at the startup time of this IPCC process. But one of the things which is constraining us as we move to higher and higher resolution uh, is the cost of the computers which are required to run these models. And just to refine some of Andrew's comments further, we don't just have a set of equations that we have to represent on this, on this, on this grid, if you like. But we have separate sets of equations for the ocean, for the atmosphere, for the sea ice, for land surface processes and, and plants, if you like, as well. So just so I'm clear, the, surface biology. the grid boxes don't just take a look at the surface. They go down into the water. They, they go, go up into the sky. They so they're, they're quite three-dimensional. Three-dimensional in the oceans, three-dimensional in the atmosphere, even three-dimensional for sea ice and three-dimensional for, uh, hmm. for biological processes. So uh, this challenge is, real, is a really severe one. And it's one that uh, is basically uh, <coughs> forces us, if you like, to, to move forward by staying abreast of the available computational technology. OK, in which case, Andrew, how long does it take to design and program a current model? Well, they're kind of, as you just heard, they're, they're sort of evolutionary. I don't think any model is ever done, really. Um, I'm sure the, the scientists there would, would, would agree with that. You do run it. You do run experiments. They're called experiments, but although there are some scientists out there looking at the modeling community who say, hey, you know, this isn't really an experimental science, um, which is part of that question that came up earlier about the, the, just the process of trying to do this creates enough space for argument because you'll never, you're always talking about ranges of probability, not about some, some precise version of reality. No, I understand. All right, but give me, give me a ballpark figure here. The, the kind of what we just looked at, the graph that we just liked the, looked at in the Gulf of Mexico. And we saw you know, what, what started out as very large boxes, if you like, for the grids are now very, very tiny. How long would it have, you know, how many years would it have taken to get to that level of precision? Well, this, again, essentially, as long as the people have been building them. The, the community climate model in, in Boulder, Colorado, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, is is essentially, uh, and someone may correct me, but it's essentially a global enterprise. Everyone's, it's multiple people, dozens of people working to add on those components you just heard about. There's a separate team just for sea ice, and there's a separate team for uh, hmm. the ocean layers, and, and, and someone is kind of the grand maestro of all this, sort of like a symphony orchestra, trying to keep track of how these components mathematically come together in a reliable way. So and, we're talking hundreds all of people. Takes, you're talking about hundreds of people and thousands and thousands of hours. I, I have a friend, a neighbor who, who works for Jim Hansen, the modeler in, uh, at NASA in New York City, and he rides the train with me, and I see, I look over his shoulder, and he's working on his code <laughs> every day. Uh, it's ki kind of, uh, it's, it's a lifetime process. It, it reminds me of cathedral building in the sense that it's just sort of, um, 
it, you don't really get to the end point. Uh, and by the time you get to the end point, then you're into maintenance. Okay, and we, we always like to talk about how much things cost around here. So, uh, <laughs> Jack, tell us, how, how much money would have been spent to come up with, say, the, the latest state-of-the-art grid and modeling? Well, it's, 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 it's very difficult, <clears throat> difficult to put a, a cost on it because it's, uh, are you going to do it by the year? Because it, these models have been, been growing over 20 years. Uh, teams of, uh, let's say, maybe even a small, even a small team, maybe 20 people. Uh, you're, they're making $100,000 a year, like $2 million a year, just to keep the thing ticking over, uh, and then per year, plus the computer costs. Uh, and Dick knows a lot more about computer costs since uh, they've just got a new facility at U of T. Uh, <clears throat> I should ask him, how much was a computer? Uh, there are two computers in this Synet system at U of T, and, and they're about $30 million altogether. $30 million for the two computers? $30 million for the two computers, right, and, and uh, ancillary equipment. Okay. It's much more powerful even than that at the Princeton GFDL laboratory now. Okay, and yours is one team. We just heard there's one in Colorado. How many around the world would there be? How many different teams that w would be working on this? I would, I would estimate that number at around somewhere between 15 and 20. I mean, in the yeah. last uh, uh, yeah. IPCC report in the AR4, I think we took 16, 16 to 18 models from the international commu mm -hmm. uh, community and used them in, a, in, in an average sense to try mm -hmm. to understand the idea of ensemble prediction. So if you consider a planet with six billion people, 15 teams is not that many. Not that many at not all. Not that many no. at all people working on this. Okay, Andrew, back to you then. We assume that all of these different 15 or 20 teams are fed data from around the world. Who oversees the data to make sure it's all accurate? Well, you, <laughs> this is the issue that came up late last year and into this year with um, uh, the reliability of the, the basic temperature records and other kinds of data that give us the portrait of existing monitor change in the world today have come under increasing scrutiny lately. The, the overall picture of, histor of history of, recent history of warming has not, not been damaged by that. But when you go back in time, it, the models, the, the whole idea of the model is to create a reliable planet, a, a mathematical ver variant that works like the one we know. So, so you, you have to, you're testing the reliability of it in, in part by doing modeling and trying to replicate patterns that, that you know about that happened in the last 100 years or, or 200 years. And so the more, questions you have about that picture, the more questions you still have about how the model works. And that, that's, again, unfortunately, that this is a field where there's enough wiggle room, enough uh, gray areas. Uh, the, the, the crystal ball is always going to be uh, cloudy enough, as Steve Schneider likes to describe the modeling, that people can come out with different assertions and they're hard to, sometimes they're hard to kind of get to the bottom of. Okay, let me follow up on that then with um, Jack. All of the major modeling that we've seen so far predicts, projects, that the world will warm roughly between one and a half degrees Celsius and four and a half degrees Celsius by the year 2100. What accounts for all of the models coming up with different temperature projections? It's how they're all built. <clears throat> they're all different teams, build their models different ways. And now we all use the same basic equations. Uh, uh, busy, See, that's what it's, you it's think. Physics. If you put all the same numbers in, you'd figure you get the same numbers. Same out. equation about how you, how you treat them. You actually you have to know you do. Uh, you have a, a, a continuum, which is represented by all these uh, discrete points, these grid boxes, and they're approximated in different ways. Uh, they can be done uh, what's called spectrally. They can be done for various various types of uh, of approximation for the grid cells. Uh, and then you get down to things like in the bound <coughs> this, the, where we live in the boundary layer, how you represent that, people do it different ways. How you represent uh, cloud formation, that's done in, in slightly different ways, which is actually good because it means that we're looking at it, we're <coughs> looking at the elephant from slightly different ends, mm -hmm. and we don't get, always get the same result. Dick, you want to add to that, why there would be that variance if you're using the same information in all of these different groups? Yeah, I think I would I'd add a, 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 a couple of further comments, actually, just to reinforce some of the things that Jack has said. We have, we have uh, certain components of the physical system, atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, land surface processes that we can resolve explicitly. The grid boxes are basically small enough that we can do that. But there are other processes like rain, precipitation, cloud radiation interactions that we have more trouble with. Uh, and so we have to represent these, these processes that are unresolved, if you like, on the scale of the grid box 
using parameterization schemes, we call them. And each of these, these, these groups... English, sorry. Parameterization. Representations of these small-scale <laughs> processes <laughs> okay. in terms of large-scale quantities like wind and temperature, which are resolved on the scale of the boxes. And all of the modeling groups, which design their own <coughs> personal national uh, climate model, they do these parameterization schemes in slightly different ways. The models are then tuned to allow them to replicate modern climate over the observational era, over the instrumental era. era. And this requires different trade-offs among the parameterization schemes. That's one way, I think, a useful way of actually looking at why these models make slightly different projections mm. of future climate going forward. Uh, and that's really why when we, when we make a best projection, if you like, we use an ensemble of model predictions. Because in doing so, we are able to average over the different uh, assumptions that are made in the parameterization schemes. And what we discover is that that ensemble prediction, if you like, that average prediction, is actually a much better fit to what actually happens than the predictions of any one model. And this is actually a really, really important point about the way IPCC operates. Andrew, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I'd love one question that, that sits in my mind uh, almost every day when I'm thinking about this is, what is it about that, that wide range of possible warming from a doubling mm -hmm. of the greenhouse gases that makes that such an enduring part of the puzzle? There's, there's, uh, everything I've seen, including the recent IPCC report, says that we shouldn't expect the fifth IPCC report to come out with a, a much more clarity on, on that basic question. You know, it's a huge range from 1.5 from 1 to 4.5 degrees that really takes us from probably manageable warming to something completely disruptive and, and unique in our, in our history. And what is it that, that keeps that, that such a, an enduring puzzle, the sensitivity question? Okay, either one of you want to take a kick yeah. at that? Go ahead, all right, okay. Dick, go first. Yeah, just, it's just, just the journalist just a, in me. Just a comment, <laughs> I mean, right at the, right at the, the, the hairy red edge of the research enterprise, you know, is, you know, where we're, where we're working now on this precise issue that Andrew's drawn <coughs> attention to. It is how to diminish the difference in these predictions of the amount of warming that we can expect to, to, to happen going forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there's a, a, an enormous amount of effort going on in the community to try to reduce the uncertainty. And so we discover things like the, f the way in which these models replicate the impact of the amplitude of temperature variations during an annual cycle mm -hmm. due to the amount of the surface that's covered in winter by snow. And we find there's a correlation between the way in which the models the, the way in which the amplitude of the annual cycle depends on the amount of snow that falls on the continents. And we see there's a correlation between that effect and the so-called sensitivity of the climate model involved. So this is the kind of research which the community is very deeply involved in now, mm. trying mm. to understand <coughs> those physical processes in the model which are most determinant of its sensitivity. Okay, Jack, as you follow up on this, I, I suspect if people woke up and, you know, if it was 12 degrees out or 15 degrees out, they wouldn't think there was a humongous difference. Yeah, right. Um, but here, I, I, I want to know that does the roughly three degree difference that we're talking about here indicate that everybody is basically on the same page on this or that it actually is a fairly wide variety? Personally, I, I don't think it's, it's a humongous variety, but I guess what worries people is that uh, during the last ice age, the temperature, mean temperature between the global temperature, not just Toronto temperature or Chicago, uh, the global temperature difference between the ice age and the last glacial minimum 20,000 years ago mm -hmm. and the Holocene maximum is maybe about 8 degrees, 6 to 8 degrees. So it's uh, in that context of a global average, then 3 degrees uh, difference either way. If we say we're talking about you know, 3 degrees plus or minus a couple of degrees. Yeah, it is quite large. It is quite large. Hmm. But, part, but the equations themselves, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is they're, they're not what's called nonlinear. It means if you double something, uh, normally we think if you double something, uh, it's related that you would, uh, you would get an increasing uh, sort of linear relation. But the equations that we deal with are very nonlinear. You can, you can just uh, perturb them a little bit and you can have something completely different occur. Hmm. Uh, and uh, Edward, Lor Edward Lor Lorenz at, uh, I think, end, find you the end of MIT, uh, uh, was the one that this, this is the whole idea of chaos. It's not really chaos in the sense because the, 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 the variables tend to oscillate in a sort of domain that's a region 
that, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's quite close, but there is na a natural variability in the system. Okay, Andrew, let me try this with you as we try to uh, get a distinction between the weather and climate, which are two different things. Someone can verify the accuracy of a computer weather forecasting model by comparing the daily predictions with the actual weather day after day. That's not that tough. But climate model predictions go decades into the future, not days. So how can you realistically verify the accuracy of climate prediction models? Well, it's mostly done, again, by looking not forward, because it's going to take, basically, we'll be so far into the experiment that the, it'll be meaningless at that point. When, once we verify that nature is following the course uh, somewhere in that 1.5 to 4.5 degree warming trajectory, uh, for a couple of decades, you, you, won't get, you won't get reliability within five or ten years. And the modelers uh, I talk to every, every, every week are saying they're facing this uh, loud uh, complaint from some out there who say, well, you know, it's, it got cold this year, therefore your model's not reliable because you said greenhouse gases go up and it should just get warmer. But as you just heard a minute ago, the system is not a smooth, it's not a smooth ride to a warm, in a warming world. It's uh, wiggly and and you would, it would take, and, and uh, your, your, the fellows in the studio there would probably help confirm this, um, at least a couple of decades before you'd start to say, hey, you know, we really are seeing what we expected. It's one of the, one of the paradoxes in this business is by the time <coughs> it's clear, it's too late to uh, kind of say, oh, now we have to get busy. <laughs> Dick, you want to confirm that? <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to, you know, look at this from a slightly different perspective. In fact, there are two, two different ways that, that uh, <coughs> we uh, in, the, in the climate business try to confirm the validity of, of our models. And it's actually useful in the sense to look back at the sequence of uh, reports that have come out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the last 25 years now of effort. Okay. Right? Each time the system makes a projection forward to roughly 2100, uh, and five years later, right, the models have improved, it makes another projection, right, mm -hmm. and it discovers whether the projection that was made five years previously was accurate or not. And so what happened in the second assessment report is that it was discovered that the projections in the first assessment report were for far too large warming. But in the second report, right, there was an enormous effort ma made uh, to understand the impact of atmospheric aerosols on the amount of warming that would occur for a given amount of CO2 increase. And so this new physical process was inserted into the models. And what happened in the AR2 is that the amount of, again, looking forward from the AR3 perspective on the validity of the projections that were made five years previously, mm -hmm. there was far too little, there was too little warming. That is that the sulfate aerosol was having far too strong an effect, right? The models were improved at that time. The d deep ocean processes were added to the models. And in the AR3, a new projection okay, was made so, for it. So if right? we're looking at a graph then, right? the, the graph is kind of going like this So then. we're bootstrapping, yeah. right, as we go forward, checking ourselves with model improvements against past behavior. But so does, that, does that add to your credibility or detract from it? Um, I, I think it, it adds to the credibility, but it's only one way in which, we, in which we're able to, to actually test these models. Another way which is used, is, which is a way that I'm very heavily involved in myself, is to take what we know about climates in the sometimes distant past. For example, uh, at the last maximum in, of glaciation, when Canada was covered by an ice sheet that was about four kilometers thick, right? This is the last maximum of glaciation. Um, there is a great deal of information about the ocean state, about the atmospheric state, uh, that we know were characteristic of that time. So what we do is we take the models w that we employ to make forward predict predictions, and we change the boundary condi conditions to correspond to those which obtained in the Ice Age and ask, do the models perform? Do and they allow us to understand this complex state, which <coughs> is so far removed from the present state? If the models pass that, that test, then we believe we've made real progress because we've shown that the models do have validity well outside of the range uh, in which they've been tuned, to use the word that I used previously. Okay, and Jack, are they passing the test so far? I think so, yeah, the models are. I mean, if you think about it, we, uh, the weather forecast models do a reasonable <coughs> job, but they only do a reasonable job out for one week to two weeks, maybe long range, maybe uh, monthly, monthly climate predictions. Mm -hmm. And they're basically the same set of equations, uh, except climate models have got more stuff in them. They've got no, no biosphere in them. They've got the uh, moving ocean and moving, moving ice. 
So uh, it's basically the same set, but the more things you add, the more uncertainty you're likely to have just because of the interactions between all the different components. Our producer, Daniel Kitts, found this. Uh, this is an, a paper that was written a few years ago, Philosophical Transactions <coughs> of the Royal Society. And I want to read this quote uh, to all of you, and then, Andrew, perhaps I'll get you to comment on it first. Global climate model results are interdependent due to the substantial collaborations between modeling centers, the publication of results in the literature, understanding based on the same textbooks, and in particular, the similarities of modern computer hardware across research centers, as all groups face similar constraints due to the limits of technology. This reduces the confidence inspired by the agreement of results across a given generation of climate models. The paper, Andrew, seems to be suggesting that models that they're coming up with, they're coming up with similar results because they're similar to begin with. So is it possible that the models aren't coming up with similar results because the science is clear, but because they're all making the same mistakes? Well, there's um, boy, I've got lots. It's of a small community the studio. Everybody wants <laughs> yeah. in on this one. Okay, Andrew, you it start us off. It is basically a small community. It's a small community, and just as the glaciology community is small, and and uh, I did, I just, I went through this exercise recently with the sea ice people. I, I pretty much have all their email addresses, and I generate group discussions via email. There is a, there is a risk sometimes of, of groupthink in this business, um, and the peer review process means that people who know about modeling are are peer reviewing the papers of others who, who do, and there is some common framework to a lot of the models. And, but I do think they're, they're still ultimately very competitive um, teams out there, and someone would be very quick to rip apart someone else's model if, or results if, <laughs> if he or she thought that there was a problem there. And science is still a very competitive arena. To me, uh, in talking about it over the years, it, it's kind of like intellectual piranhas. A, a new paper comes out and everyone it sort of chomps away at the, at the weak flesh until all that's left. The new knowledge is the very sturdy things that can't be uh, argued against. So, so I think overall uh, there's a pretty decent sense of confidence that, that the picture, the general picture here of more greenhouse gases warming world and some of the other details is, is pretty reliable. Jack, is it possible you're all making the same mistake? It's possible, in fact, <laughs> it's, uh, but I don't think so. Uh, I mean, and certainly in the early IPCC report, some of the, uh, some of the models used had cloud parameterizations which are not very good and actually detracted from the results looking back at the time. That's sort of natural progress. I think it's just natural progress. I think Andrew hit the nail on the head. I think scientists are very competitive. We're just human beings. Uh, we like to be first, and we, uh, we like to have the, the, best, the best new uh, <coughs> theory. And uh, so that's what happens is if, you, if someone comes up with some new idea of what's going to be important in climate change, you'll have all these teams will actually, will actually analyze it uh, to death to, uh, to make sure, in fact, that the, uh, the, uh, the idea is worthy of, uh, of including in, the, in, the, in a model. And you'd love to prove the other guy wrong if you could, course, wouldn't you? Because yeah. you'd rather have gotten there first. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Dick, you wanted to say? Well, that's absolutely the case. I mean, this is, this is <coughs> you know, a key characteristic of the scientific method. This is the, these are the rules we live by. We publish what we think to be the truth, you know, in papers in the peer-reviewed literature, and once they are in the peer-reviewed literature, they become grist for the mill, um, and they are attacked by competitors. And the notion that science, the, that science and scientists collude is uh, absolute. It, you couldn't, it couldn't be <coughs> possibly be further from the truth. Because you all just dislike each other too much it's to It's not a question that. of personal <laughs> dislike. It's not a question at all of personal dislike. Okay. Once in a while, of course, that had r rises. But, but it's, it's a question of intellectual competition. And, but we work through the peer-reviewed process. We put our uh, thoughts as to where the truth lies you know, in, the, in the open published literature, and it then becomes grist for the mill. We don't actually work with, uh, uh, how shall I say, the journalistic literature. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in journalism, one can make a comment uh, on the basis of personal belief, and it just gets out there. Right. Scienti you know, that sort of commentary is not grist for the scientific mill. You know, we think we, uh, we work to a higher standard, and we suffer for it too, because when we make mistakes, these mistakes become <coughs> a part of the scientific record. They don't just disappear into the ether. No, it's always there, So isn't it? this is the standard that we live by. We work through the peer-reviewed literature and live or die by it. Okay, Andrew. Um, in the early 80s, I wrote it, my, the first stories I wrote about climate and humans were about nuclear winter, which initially was a very powerful, scary thought that all that smoke coming from all the cities exploded in a nuclear war would chill the earth and create a you know, terrible 
uh, long-lasting disaster way beyond even the war itself. And uh, a couple of years later, some other modelers, uh, Steve Schneider at, at Stanford and now and Starley Thompson, published a paper saying, you know what, it actually looks like it's more like nuclear autumn. In other words, <laughs> there, was, there was a competitive, <laughs> there was less of a front page thought in that. Mm. But science moved forward. And by the way, still there are some scientists, Alan Ro Robach at Rutgers, who thinks we still face a serious threat, even from a small scale India-Pakistan kind of war. Mm -hmm. But you mm -hmm. see a uh, progression of understanding. And, and in the modeling community here, looking at CO2 and other greenhouse gases, with all the complexities, <coughs> again, the basic picture, and models, I think, are most useful for generating the basic picture. They're not the single uh, thing here. Um, it has, been, has remained robust. Okay, I know a couple of you have mentioned the issue of clouds and how that might impact, have an impact, rather, on uh, some of the modeling that goes on so far. And I wanted to show some video that NASA from the United States uh, put out about the lack of certainty that is, exists out there in the scientific community about the impact clouds might have affecting climate change. Michael, let's roll that if we could. Clouds also reflect a lot of sunlight. As our planet warms, more water evaporates, potentially creating more clouds. More cloud cover increases the Earth's brightness, possibly helping to cool the planet. But clouds, and the small particles called aerosols that help them form, are climate wildcards. Many current climate models predict some cooling due to increased cloud cover. Will it be enough to significantly slow warming? Scientists are using NASA data to look for the answer. Further complicating the issue is that water vapor is actually the world's most abundant greenhouse gas. That's right, the same molecules that might cool the planet in cloud form actually warm it when they're in the form of a gas. Okay, let's get into some discussion about the so-called wild cards, as the NASA documentary there put it. Uh, Jack, to you first. What are the biggest unknowns about the future of the climate that the computer models have to deal with? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I mean, sorry, clouds are an issue. And the interaction with aerosols, who like are uh, with clouds, and aerosol, you can think of uh, part particulates in the atmosphere. Okay, they can be humanly uh, generated by humans, you know, anthropogenic, uh, from uh, pollution. It uh, can be ge generated off uh, dust off, uh, off deserts. Uh, how they interact, because they act, they act as nuclei on which water condenses and form cloud droplets. Uh, I, I think that's important. Um, which way that will go. Will, will the, the balance right now is, is quite tight between clouds warming and clouds cooling. Hmm. High clouds will tend to warm, low clouds will tend to cool. Uh, one in the infrared, one in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the visible. So uh, that's a big wild card. That's, I don't think, well, I used to think it was, a, personally I used to think it was a wild card. I don't think it is. I think our understanding is, is improved uh, a lot. I think there are more, perhaps more important things. And one of, the th one of the problems I just suddenly realized about a couple of years ago, the problem with the IPCC uh, is that it has been really very conservative in a lot of its uh, uh, prognostications, and its, its forecasts. And uh, things that concern me is uh, the, uh, you know, for example, as a permafrost uh, melts, there's the, going to be a, a large methane release. There's enough carbon in the permafrost that is equivalent to all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right now. Hmm. Uh, if the, uh, the clathrates, the methane and clathrates, which is sort of frozen ice, methane ice, uh, under the, uh, the shelf of Siberia, if that was to, to be released, uh, and uh, that would be a huge, uh, enormous input of a, a very potent greenhouse gas, 30 times more potent than, uh, than CO2. Now, there's a caveat there. Uh, it's more potent, but its lifetime is only about 10 years. Carbon dioxide, we're talking 200, 300, 400 years. But when it's finished, when it's oxidized, uh, it also will be carbon dioxide. Those sound like so wild I think those are, those are our those important are things that I would I'd be, uh, that I'm concerned about. Dick Pelche, what's on your list? Um, maybe I comment on this clouds and climate thing to start with sure. before I comment on the really wild wild cards. Um, it's really interesting to look back, you know, in the history of the development of the issue of the interaction of clouds and climate, back to very famous papers that were written in the late 70s, late 60s, pardon me, by Siokira Manabe and colleagues, Weatherald and others at the Geophysical Fluid Mechanics Laboratory in, in, in Princeton. Um, Suki's calculation at that time, which took into account the influence of, of clouds, either with clouds in his very simple one-dimensional atmosphere now, very, very simple calculation, gave a climate sensitivity of something like 2.13 degrees uh, 
uh, in the presence of average clouds, that is if you double CO2, the mean temperature at the surface would go up by 2.13 degrees. If you take all the clouds away, the temperature would go up by something like 2.9 degrees. Hmm. Average those two numbers, you get a, a climate sensitivity of you know 2.5 degrees or so, right in the middle of the climate, sensi <laughs> climate yes. sensitivity that the most complicated models we've been ever been able to build hmm. are predicting. Right. So let's not get crazy on this issue of um, you know how bad the models are because of it's all in the same ballpark. It's all in the same ballpark. Now let me just comment on what I think to be real wild cards in the in the in the climate issue. The first of these, I think, is one that Andrew commented on very briefly, and I think it's potentially very important, and it is to do with the stability of the great ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica. Our current generation of climate models have no skill at all in predicting what the response of these large accumulations of land ice will be in response to global warming. They have no skill. This is a major focus of international activity in the climate world now. So number one, wild card. Number two wild card may be even more important, and it is to do with the fact that um, the very deep um, uh, uh, structure of water over the continents, where the water table is, right, uh, is not actually captured in these climate models. Typically, climate models have a thin skin on the top of the, on the, top of the Earth's, Earth's surface, maybe going down to a few meters. We can't presently predict what the impact on the water table will be as a consequence of warming. So another mm -hmm. wild card. So this is another area in which there's very active research going on. We, we don't know everything, but we do know that there are certain problems that we really have to get right, especially with respect to the large ice sheets issue because that has tremendous implications for sea level. And to go back to Jack's point, which is that the IPCC has taken a very conservative you know, position on, on, on especially that issue, um, we really are in no position to know with any degree of certainty what, what is liable to happen with these large ice masses in response to warming. Okay, Andrew, so many things to follow up on there. The, the IPCC being too conservative, the, the notion of a tipping point, um, maybe your list of wild cards. Where do you want to pick up on there? Well, uh, I wrote a pretty long story last year about the whole question of tipping points or sort of one-way points of no return. Um, and the tundra question, gas is coming out of the, uh, the, the tundra and or the near shore um, shallow areas in the Arctic is certainly one of those. Um, the, there, the, IP, the last IPCC report and a couple of papers since have put significant constraints on, on the probability of the sensitivity, the rise in temperature being uh, in that low range. The 1.5 degrees is looking less and less likely. And what they've also found is there is hard, it's very hard to constrain the upper end. That 4.5, there's, it could be above there. And there, uh, there was a fight within the IPCC over whether to just punt when you have no way to constrain the, the <laughs> level of risk or, or to just describe it freely. You know, we just don't know. And Steve Schneider, who, who I wrote about in my tipping point story, said that he feels, and other scientists and some economists feel, you have to really pay attention to that those things out there that where even though they're at the end of the range, that doesn't mean they're improbable. It just means we don't understand them very well. So let me just and clarify that's an, here. An important and distinction. Does, does this mean that the models could not only be overestimating how hot it could get, but they could also be dramatically underestimating how hot it could get? Yeah, I'd be curious to hear from the, from the folks there, but I, I have a sense definitely that there's little there's high, fairly high confidence that it won't be less than 1.5. And there's not a lot of confidence that we've got a cap at 4.5. Okay, Jack, you want to follow up on that? I'm not confident <coughs> in the cap. You're not the, confident in the cap, in the cap. so you're yeah, and, and uh, but, but also, it's, uh, it's also the regional distribution of, of the effect is important as well. And it, isn't just a, sure. it isn't just a number, because you know, if, the, if the Arctic uh, ice cap, the, the, sorry, the Greenland ice cap goes, uh, the, t the average temperature might stay within that range, but the regional effects are going to be dr quite dramatic. Tell me what that means. Oh, well, sorry, regional effect. Well, what's, what's it going to be like in Toronto uh, versus uh, Calgary uh, versus uh, Houston uh, versus Bangladesh, somewhere in Bangladesh, you know, with sea rising? Uh, hmm. I think uh, one of the things that where we're going now with, regional, with uh, climate modeling is uh, is starting to worry about more regional effects. We're not this, rather than talk in terms of a, of a global average temperature, 
which, it, which to most people, I think, is a little <coughs> bit incomprehensible. Why worry about four degrees? Is, uh, well, what's Toronto going to get? Are we going to get more severe weather in southwest Ontario because uh, of uh, more, more, hu uh, more humid air coming <coughs> up from the Gulf? Well, again, just uh, so I'm clear, so f I mean, the global average temperature increase of four and a half degrees could mean 10 somewhere and one exactly. somewhere else. Well, exactly. So if you're yeah. part of the 10, that's a very big deal. Yeah, exactly. Way, we're, yeah, we're talking because we're, we're talking about in the Arctic itself, and which has already started to happen. Uh, by, uh, by all means, uh, is the Arctic, we, we might, the global average is maybe six, but the Arctic may be 15 or 20 hmm. uh, during certain terms, times of the year. Uh, okay, in, Dick in and Andrew both want to follow up on this. Go ahead, Dick. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to again, reinforce the <coughs> comment that Jack has just made, I mean, one of the main characteristics that all of the global climate change models predict and which the data verify in spades, you know, is that there is, you know, a process called, you know, high latitude polar amplification, which means that our Arctic, you know, warms by twice as much as the global average. Hmm. All of the models basically agree on this. Um, so for Canada, this is one of the most important aspects, if you like, of the model predictions. Our north is going to get it and is getting it um, in spades. But one more comment I think that's worth, worth adding in, into, this, into this mix concerns the feedbacks which are making the warming proceed faster than um, early model projections have suggested. Uh, and one of these feedbacks has to do with the rate at which the oceans are able to absorb carbon dioxide. We know that the rate at which they're able to absorb carbon dioxide goes down as they absorb carbon dioxide because the oceans become more, more acidic. And this is going to be a major focus in the current IPCC AR5 process, right? Trying to understand, it, trying to get much more clarity on the extent to which that positive feedback on warming, that is more CO2 stays in the atmosphere mm -hmm. and less is drawn down by the oceans. This is another one of those positive feedbacks on the warming process that you can think of it as a wild card in the deck as well because our ability to describe that with accuracy is still an issue. Sure, Andrew, you wanted to say. Yeah, and of course, so far we've only discussed um, uh, temperature. We haven't talked about precipitation. And there's mm -hmm. a whole nother question. Uh, there's still a lot of complexities about how that plays out. And of course, the most important thing in many places isn't temperature, it's, it's how much rain you get if you're talking about agriculture. Sure. And, and in certain parts of the world, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is one of these areas where there's still very poor skill, very poor understanding of what a globally warming planet will do regionally. And here you have a region, you know, Africa's population is expected to double between now and 2050, going from one to two billion most living in deep poverty and most in regions that are already water stressed. So knowing, and, and the modelers like Gavin Schmidt, again, in, in, who works uh, with Jim Hansen at NASA, he's written on his real climate blog and I wrote in, 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 on Dot Earth repeatedly. Um, there's no sign that even with growing resolution with bigger, pow more powerful computers, that doesn't necessarily lead you to better uh, regional and short-term skill in, in figuring out what the weather will be, as you say, in, in Saskatchewan or, or Chicago. That's one of the real, and again, that's what society is craving. Okay, Jack, let me do something that I probably have no business doing, and that is putting myself in the minds of the people who are watching this right now and, and suspecting that a good number of them are saying to themselves, these computer models that you guys have come up with are very impressive, but at the end of the day, they are numbers in a computer, they are trying to measure something that is unbelievably complex. And I'm not sure I'm prepared to completely turn upside down the lifestyle which I have led for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years based on mathematical modeling, which even the three of you agree is not 100% perfected yet. What do you want to say to that? Well, <clears throat> well the mathematical model, the mathematical modeling that's used uh, predicts that aircraft will fly. Uh, it designs aircraft, designs cars. It predicts that the Earth goes around the uh, uh, the, the sun. Uh, I, th I think the I think it's uh, what we have is all we have. The, the alternative, I think, is to bury our heads in the sand or perhaps uh, t look at the entrails of chickens or something like that. There, I think modeling is much better than looking at the well, entrails of chickens. Okay, so then let me dick do something that's really unfair. <laughs> and, and let me. Say <laughs> Yes, okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> let, me, let me try this. There were a lot of people in the financial services business who said, we've got very sophisticated algorithmic mathematical modelings of our computers that show that if you do these credit default swaps and, and wrap them up and send them overseas and, and you know, uh, 
nothing bad's going to happen. And then Bear Stearns went down the toilet, and Lehman Brothers doesn't exist anymore. So will Listen. you forgive that we're not completely <laughs> sold on this whole mathematical algorithmic modeling of computers? I'm okay? happy to try to, to, to respond for that, <laughs> and I can do so in a very, very simple way by drawing your attention to the fact that in economics there is no F equals MA. Right? Force right? equals? Mass times acceleration. Mass times acceleration. Right? <laughs> there is no law. There okay. is only statistics. <laughs> okay. Right? And so, and therefore, you know, it's a bad analogy. It's a, it's a terrible analogy. Absolutely. I said it was a bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a terrible <laughs> analogy. The one up me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me read this because we. How am I doing on time here? Six minutes. Gosh. Okay. Uh, Michael, I'm going right to page six, the, um, the board on page six. This is a bit long, but stick with me here, folks, because we got this today an email from an Oxford University professor. A really important point that such programs often miss is that the question, are climate models fit for purpose? is misleading if you read it as meaning that there's only one purpose for a climate model. Even a very simple model that you could write down on the back of an envelope, solve on a laptop, and constrained by nothing more than the laws of physics and the changes we've observed in global climate over the past 50 years or so, might well be good enough for making mitigation decisions, like when and how much we need to cut emissions if we want to avoid more than two degrees of warming, for example. But, he goes on to say, even the most complex and sophisticated models we have available today may still be inadequate for adaptation decisions. How high, for example, to build seawalls. This is important because we clearly still need to keep developing the models to make reliable predictions for adaptation. But it's unlikely that the next generation of models, or the generation after that, is going to tell us anything radically different from today's models about the need to cut emissions to avoid dangerous climate change. Scientists are always understandably reluctant to admit they are done and climate modeling is by no means done. But that doesn't mean we cannot base decisions on today's models, which as far as global temperature projections are concerned, give pretty much the same answer as models written in the 1980s. Okay, react. Andrew, you first. Well, he's making some very important points, uh, which you could actually, I've written about this in relation to the IPCC enterprise itself. To some extent, there by perpetuating, you know, we're going to have a fifth report in 2013, 2014, and onward. Um, there's an expectation built that someday we'll have crystalline clear knowledge, and and unfortunately, again, if you look at things like that wide range of sensitivity, the the persistent question of how fast sea levels will rise in our time, in the in, from here to 2100. Those questions are unlikely to be resolved quickly. And just look at hurricanes. This is an area where a lot of modeling effort has gone in. And actually, you have what's called negative learning. The more people have studied hurricanes in a warming world, the less clear the picture has become. Um, in fact, the most recent studies say we'll have fewer hurricanes now, but there'll be more of the stronger ones. So if you, again, if you're a policymaker or a risk manager, how do you deal with that? Hmm. It, it, no one should expect uh, a clarifying picture necessarily with more and more study and that doesn't mean it's not important by the way one other quick thing that's uh, important right now there's a big push within the modeling community the climate community to start shifting the role and the and the, the, the duties of modelers toward more true forecasting and not just um, the general prediction of things like climate sensitivity okay three minutes left here so let's go Jack and then Richard uh, I've lost a, lost a thread. that well try this well, yeah, the uh, yeah, well, to some extent, he's, he, may be, he may be right, but I'm really concerned uh, about the regional modeling, the, 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 about the effect that the different, different regions like Southwest Ontario or Saskatchewan will have uh, completely different effects. We're not going to, the, the global four degrees, if that's what we take, mm -hmm. is going to have uh, totally different impacts on, uh, on Southwest Ontario versus Saskatchewan. And we're not appreciating those distinctions. I yet. think we're not, but certainly, certainly the forecasts are right now is that the, uh, the whole, the Southwest US and the Western US, and which will probably include uh, 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 Canada, uh, will suffer a drought, you know, severe drought, mm -hmm. uh, which is in some sense almost historical, uh, uh, quasi-historical uh, uh, in, the, in the next uh, 30 or 40 years. Okay, Dick, you wanted to say? Well, I mean, when you begin to talk about, about, about policy and, and how policymakers react, can react to the pr predictions of these models, you know, you are, you know, driven to begin to think regionally about, about, uh, about impacts. And that's one of the region, one of the reasons, one of the areas, if you like, in which the science is, uh, uh, has yet to show really significant skill. Um, mm -hmm. And so for Ontario, for example, just to stick with that example for a moment, I mean, the Great Lakes Basin happens to be 
southern Ontario at least, along a divide, north of which the models are predicting increased precipitation, and south of which, generally speaking, they're predicting decreases in precipitation. So we're on a Sahel-like boundary, if you like, a steep gradient in the precipitation business. Um, and, and so the predictability of what, what is liable to be in store for Ontario is an especially delicate question, hmm. right? And, and, and therefore an especially difficult question, you know, for us to deliver uh, useful input to the policy community. And that's really one of the things we're attempting to do we're, we're attempting to do at present. Okay, Andrew, in our last minute here then, tell us this. Global models are trying to tell us what the world's climate is going to be like almost 100 years from now. People want to know, and we're discovering the regional aspect of this, what their city or their province's climate is going to be like 10 years from now or 20 years from now. What are climate modelers doing to help us answer that question? Well, as you just heard, um, if the, the, the truly, the forthright ones are saying, we're not going to be able to help you much because even with more money, more, more fine-grained models, there's little sense that we can get clarity in situations like the one that was just described. And again, in places that are highly consequential, like Africa, uh, the, 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 the clarity is even less there. So this gets back to the, 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 the thing that's built over these 20-something years. I've been writing about this since before the IPCC. The one thing that seems immutable is rising emissions, rising concentrations equals rising risk. <laughs> and um, anything beyond that gets, uh, the, what you want to do in places where you have uncertainty like you just talked about is resilience. If you mm -hmm. can build a plan, plan agriculture, whatever it is, for the possibility of a wide range of outcomes, then that's the way forward. Uh, that's the way to the end for us. Uh, Andrew Revkin in uh, New York City dot earth blog for the New York Times. Thanks so much for being with us on the line there from the Big Apple. Uh, Richard Peltier from the University of Toronto, Jack McConnell from York University. Great to have you alongside as well. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody.